Today is June 2nd, 2004, and this tape is one of a series of interviews of North Fork women for the Archives Committee of the North Fork Women for Women Fund. I am Lucille Field Goodman. Sandra Sinclair is on the camera. We are talking with Leslie Keynes Wiseman. Leslie has been part of our North Fork community for 28 years. She grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Her parents were musicians and her father practiced law. Immediately after graduating from college at the age of 22, she began teaching architecture at the University of Detroit, eventually moving to New York and making her way up to associate dean and full professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, which she joined as a founding faculty member of the School of Architecture in 1975. Until her retirement at the end of this year, Leslie has never been out of school. Leslie, tell us the reasons or events that brought you from Michigan to New York. Okay, Lucy. Well, I, um, 1974 was a profound uh, year in my life. It, it changed everything for me. At the time, I was married to a person of the male persuasion and uh, living in Detroit as a suburban Detroit and was the president of a NOW chapter, National Organization for Women chapter, card-carrying feminist. And um, I was teaching at U of D and the only woman on the faculty, the youngest on the faculty, it was a Jesuit university. And I couldn't figure out what the relationship between my politics as a feminist had to do with my work in architecture. And I was almost ready to leave the field and find something else that I thought was socially meaningful. And in 1974, I was asked to attend and to be on a plenary panel the first conference of women architects ever held in the United States at Washington University in St. Louis. And it was at that conference that I had to make a big decision. I met Phyllis Berkby, who was an architect in New York, and I met three other architects, one from Cambridge, one from um, San Francisco, and the other from Vermont. And as we were sitting around at a bar, actually, at, at this conference in the evening, I made a proposal to them. I said, you know, I don't want to go back to being isolated in my classroom. Again, as a feminist, I want to found a school of our own where we can raise questions about the relevance of architecture and planning to feminism and to women and to gender studies. And they agreed that it was an insane idea, but they nevertheless said they'd let me play this out. <laughs> and then about a month later, I was supposed to go to Houston, Texas for the National Now Conference, and instead I chose to go to California to the Women's Building where there was another conference, the West Coast Women's Design Conference. And through those two conferences, um, and my ongoing connection with Phyllis Berkby, who was an active lesbian feminist, that I decided to leave my husband to come out as a lesbian. Uh, I moved in with Phyllis for a year. The relationship was not meant to endure for very long. But our collaboration endured for many years beyond our personal relationship. I got divorced and I got a job to help found the School of Architecture at um, what was then Newark College of Engineering so I could move to New York with a paying job and found what became the Women's School of Planning and Architecture with these other women who were in different parts of the country. Uh, the Women's School of Planning and Architecture, WSBA WISPA as we call it, um, was an international uh, a school that was a, really a summer school that went on for eight years on rented college campus facilities around the country. It had a huge impact. Uh, many of the women who attended were um, became pioneers in the field, as I did in terms of publications and lectures and so on, on the relationship between gender studies and architecture. Um, many, many organizations spun off the Women's Development Corporation, which does affordable housing for low-income women, was a part of WISPA. And uh, the school, in fact, became so significant that um, we now have, ironically, a very large archives. When Phyllis died, 
tragically of cancer. Uh, her papers went to Smith College, and among those papers were some of the women's school planning and architecture papers. We now have a WISPA archives at Smith, and two years ago I held a 28-year reunion mm -hmm. of the women who attended, the alumnae from WISPA. And it was enormously successful, and it's because of that archive that I also know Cheryl Redmond, who is now doing the Nufwoof archives. And when I was president of Nufwoof, it was a pleasure to help put that in place. So those are really the reasons I wound up in New York. What, or should I ask, who brought you to the North Fork 28 years ago? <laughs> the smell of women brought me <laughs> to the North Fork. All three of them, I think. There weren't very many women out here at the time. Actually, Phyllis knew, and I met, I met you and Bev and Nancy, I think, just about at the same time, Lucy. Um, about 1975, I think. And in 76, uh, Phyllis and I were still together. We ended our relationship that year. But we rented, uh, Beva mentioned that there were some, I, I had been in New York a year and knew I could not endure a summer in, in the city, in Chinatown, which is where we were living. And Phyllis suggested we speak to Beva about finding some place out here for the summer. Beva, of course, grew up out here in the summer. And Beva put us in touch with Marilyn Northland, a local realtor who was doing all the rentals. We rented a way too expensive place on the Sound that we couldn't afford for a month went off to California to run a WISP summer session at Berkeley, and then um, I came back by myself and left Phyllis in California, and I started looking around. Anne Mackay actually mentioned that there was a sign up on Young's Road saying cottages for rent. So I went down there and looked, and it was the three little cottages owned by the Klingons at the end of Young's Road on the Sound that became kind of the second Bluefish Cove, the other lesbian enclave. I rented on my own the one cottage, the other two were occupied by straight couples, for the fall season and then got on very well with the Klingons and asked them if I could rent permanently. And um, began to share the, that cottage with other women and um, asked if more women could rent the other cottages and so it grew into a, a small little group of, of people. Um, I'm trying to think what else to say about the, the rentals. At the time, there weren't very many lesbians out here. There were probably maybe a dozen tops, less probably. And we all knew each other, of course. And in those early days, um, if you know, you we would have Labor Day parties and Fourth of July parties and Memorial Day weekend parties on the beach with you know potluck barbecues. And if you invited every single person you knew, whether you really liked them or not, and every house guest they had, <laughs> you might have 20. I have some wonderful old photos for the archives of those early days, um, which you'll remember so well. Uh, and, you know, the community, of course, has grown wonderfully and, and <laughs> is very diverse and large now, but they were wonderful days in the, in the cottage there. Yeah, some of, some of us. You and your life partner, Sharon Good, have been together for 26 years. How did you meet? 27, yeah. Ah, 27. How did you meet? Was it love at first sight? Uh, well, you'll remember it well. You were there with us <laughs> at the time. Um, Sharon was visiting uh, from England. She uh, was born in England, a Cockney, working class Cockney, social worker. And she was visiting a mutual friend of ours, uh, who she had um, been uh, generous with as a host uh, when she was visiting England. Um, Sharon's father was an American GI who um, got her mother pregnant and then returned to Worcester, Massachusetts, intending to bring the two of them over, and uh, died tragically and unexpectedly in a car accident. So Sharon had been to the States a number of times to see her family. Um, I was involved, actually, in a fundraising campaign for Marianne Krupsack's run for lieutenant governor. And there was a fundraiser that I and a number of other women were organizing at the Copacabana. And I remember asking you, Lucy, of course, we, we were going to go. And I called up B, who Sharon was visiting, who Kreloff, and um, said, oh, come on to this fundraiser. And B said, oh, I have a house guest. And I said, well, bring her. It's only $10. We'll just pile into a bunch of cabs and go off to the Copa. It's a good cause. 
And there we were meeting at the, that evening and dancing up a storm on the dance floor of the Copacabana. And that was my first introduction to Sharon. And it took us about 24 minutes <laughs> to figure, not even 24 <laughs> hours, to figure out that uh, A, we were the same age and we knew the words to the same songs. And also all the dance And steps. love to dance. And uh, we've been dancing ever since. Um, within a week's time, she had to go back, and I followed her right over to England. I got a passport in about 15 minutes, <laughs> paid off everybody I could think of at Rockefeller Center, and used up all my favors for my colleagues, because school had just started. It was in the fall of 1978. I fell in love with her, really, when I saw her at work. Um, she is an incredible healer. She was involved as a social worker with generic social work, which meant abused children, frail elderly, psychiatric patients, everyone. And, you know, I ha have an academic background and understand what it's like to kind of talk about and analyze problems. Sharon's way of solving problems was to actually empathize and relate to the individuals that she was with. One woman in particular, I remember, who was a chronic alcoholic and very, very poor, uh, was on national health and all of that. And she would constantly wander out with her annual weekly amount of money um, in a nightgown and go to the pubs and get drunk and couldn't figure out where she lived. Sharon made one of those lanyards, you know, those uh, plastic chain type things with her house key and her name on it. She went to every single pub in her neighborhood and gave them cab fare and said, now when Alice Beltier shows up, you are to give her a drink and put her in a cab and send her home <laughs> and the keys around her neck. And that, I mean, that's her idea about, you know, there was such dignity there. I thought she was remarkable, I still do. Um, she moved very shortly after in 79, within months, gave up, they were on strike. She hated being on strike. She was a labor organizer. She couldn't stand what it was doing to her clients. So she moved here to be with me, and we moved into my little apartment on, the, on Bank Street in the West Village, a uh, tiny little place, and uh, had a lot of struggle trying to keep her in this country because she was a, quote, illegal alien because though her father was an American, her, uh, mu her aunt, her father's <coughs> sister, refused because of her Roman Catholicism to acknowledge her um, legitimacy because she was not married to her brother legally at the time of her birth. So it was a real struggle. It was very hard. We managed. Um, she had to wind up actually marrying a man and it was very difficult. And It was my first really vivid personal experience with homophobia, with what it means to be a privileged American, which is what I am by birth uh, and by education and uh, to be so discriminated against. You know, when I'd been married to a man and I was supporting him the same way I would have been willingly supported Sharon, it was horrible. We went out to the cottage, though, immediately in Orient. And uh, in 79, she started, uh, it was her first summer there. And uh, we had wonderful times there. And actually, it was in 81 that something very important happened to both of us. That's when we met uh, when, when I first met, our dear, dear friend, who is no, no longer with us, tragically, also died of cancer, Connie Murray. And you will remember Connie very well. Um, Unforgettable. Yeah. Connie was the Dean of Student Services at my university, a nun at the time, a Roman Catholic nun, who had been Associate Dean at Cornell and was very involved with her religious order, the Society of the Holy Child Jesus. Uh, who's, uh, you know, actually an English um, uh, order, and uh, their um, headquarters in this country uh, is near Bryn Mawr, Rosemont uh, College in near Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Uh, anyway, Connie and I became fast friends because I was still one of the only women on campus, and Connie was certainly the only academic administrator. Um, I became associate dean a couple of years later. And she and I just did wonderful things with each other uh, for promoting diversity. We wrote the Affirmative Action Grievance Program, Compliance Program. We established gender studies. We did all kinds of radical things. I was tall and dark-haired, and she was short and blonde. And 
the two of us would walk across campus and the men would tremble <laughs> knowing. <laughs> I mean, we were going, we were probably talking about grocery shopping and they, they assumed we were plotting to overthrow the university, which we mostly were, actually. <laughs> And Connie started renting with us, and of course was on a poverty budget, though she made much more money than I did. Um, it all went to the order. So Sharon and I actually paid for Connie's share of the cottage. Sharon was working at that time for the telephone company. And uh, we did Marxist splits, you know, it was wonderful. We each gave 10% of whatever we had, and that we thought was equitable. And uh, it's how we managed, and we forged very, very important friendships, a, a family of choice that was enormously supportive, and Connie um, actually met the lesbian community through me, but in particular she met um, uh, at my um, promotion and tenure party at your house, Lucy. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1981, um, Sharon uh, and I uh, attended a party that Lucy and Patsy gave for my being promoted to, tenured actually, uh, to associate professor. And uh, Connie was very instrumental in helping me in that battle, so I invited her out, and that's, that's when she decided she wanted to come out. Yeah. Not just out to the North Fork, but out in her life. Uh, she could really relate to our community. They, we were diverse, we were professionals, intelligent, um, you know, and she, she really uh, felt a great sense of affinity with everyone. And um, so she, with great courage, left her religious order and uh, became one of us. Talk about this wonderful house, how you designed it, and what it has meant in your life and to the North Fork women's community. Okay, uh, well, we bought this house, and you know, I brought actually, it's now 16 years old, this architectural model of this house, which is sitting here on this table. And maybe I can talk about the house by looking at this a little bit. Um, we bought what was really a, an uninhabitable shack in 1985 um, in Southold, and the house was, um, you know, was the height of the real estate boom. If I could turn this, this was the house, okay. It was 18 feet wide and 36 feet long with two little bedrooms here, um, a little rickety gangplank from a driveway that went up to the front door that was rotted off. Um, it, it was just a disaster. It was, you know, really, really disgusting. <laughs> but it was uh, the only thing under $100,000 the three of us could find. So we bought it. Um, I renovated it all summer long while they were working in the city. and. Um, this turned, put in this wood burning stove and so on. In, then in um, 1989, Sharon actually left the phone company at, Connie and I begged her to leave because they were being so horrible to her that she couldn't bear the job. And she moved out here about um, 80, uh, let's see, uh, about 87. And in 88 or 9, Connie began to anticipate retirement. And, um, wanted to move out here and write full time. So I decided, we had a choice. We were either going to split up, which didn't seem reasonable, buy another big house, which I didn't want to do, build, I could design and build something from scratch, which I philosophically disagreed with because I really believe in recycling and I didn't want to use up any more open land. And so we decided to add on. And that gave me an opportunity to do some interesting things environmentally and also in terms of recycling this house designed for a t traditional husband and wife and kids into something that worked for a family of choice like ours. Uh, that would also be wheelchair accessible and on one level with the exception of this passive solar heating and cooling tower which became her study or meditation study that overlooked the sound and the gardens. Let me, this thing still comes apart. I can show you how it worked. Here's the, this is, we're on a corner lot, this is Soundview, this is Hickory. And the property goes like this. This was the original two little bedrooms. This is the little Bilko doors that go over here. And here was the little kitchen with the skylight. And this is the living room that we're in now. This was a solid wall. And what I did was I knocked that wall out over there. And in the first iteration, there was a little step down little dining porch that you'll recall. I ripped that off. And then all this was added on. 
And the way it works is like this. The, there's a road here and here, and there's this long driveway. I created a second front door and a second driveway and patio entrance here to kind of symbolically talk about a two-family household that the walls open in the center so that on the interior we have privacy and connectedness. And although I took another um, 36 by 18 foot volume, but instead of making it L-shaped this way, I crank this volume at an angle to sit on parallel to the street and the set legal setback. But I kept all the interior walls parallel to each other. So that's how come you get this kind of spatial layering in here. And this became Connie's studio apartment. These doors in the middle open up, and this was our shared dining space, which is now the garden room. And this was Connie's tower, which is a passive solar heating and cooling tower was all on one level. Uh, the sort of sleeping area here, her kitchen's here. This was where her living and dining area was. And then we come out together, this was our shared dining, we come out together into the garden in the back. Um, now, what's most important about this, and I don't know that I would ever have designed anything that looked like this from scratch, but what's most important about it for me is that little did I know at the time of its making what events would unfold and how, how they would shape Sharon and my life and, and Connie's as well. My mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was living in Florida. My father had died of cancer. My sister was down there with my mother. And after begging her, after a year of commuting with all of her chemo and everything, we finally talked her into coming up north to be with us. And we didn't realize how short a time that would be. My mother uh, died with East End Hospice uh, with that program in this home, right here, in Connie's wing. And what was amazing was that Connie moved into our wing. We assumed it was for the long haul. It was within a month. My mother died in January of uh, 1993. And I never thought when I made this thing wheelchair accessible and created this kind of level of privacy in the circulation, I never realized that someone I loved so much would need that wheelchair access. And you'll recall Lucy Jean Millar when she had ALS before she died. This was the only house that she could actually enter in and sit at the dining room in her wheelchair. Yeah. And of course, I'm now working very much with disability, uh, you know, as a analyst on universal design for the National Endowment for the Arts, but this all came out of just, you know, the f philosophy of inclusion. And to have seen how this space worked with, with people coming and going here and us having some respite and quiet there and the ability for my mother to overlook the gardens where it was peaceful and where she died with serenity and love was quite extraordinary. And then little did we know that within three or four months after my mother died, Connie was diagnosed with cancer. We got her through the first round and then there was a recurrence. She was gone. She'll be gone ten years this December. She died with the same hospice team in the same spot in this house. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> At this point we can all have a, a little cry. but. The fact is that if I never do another thing as long as I live, having made this space, I now, I now personally understand the profound impact that architecture can have on wellness, on healing, on healing one into death, and on living, and living with dignity with each other. So to me, this, is, <laughs> this would have been enough. The household that we created, the family we created, and the space in which that family lived and died um, has been extraordinary. So, But there have been such happy moments in this house. You asked about what it meant to the community. And this house became, over its many years of growth, the party house. I mean, there were garden parties that um, every summer where hundreds of women actually came. And it, it became our great joy in introducing, because we were here so long, introducing people to each other. And uh, the very first party in 85, in that summer while we were renovating, we thought the floor was going to fall in. Jill Ward and I were dancing in this corner, 
And all of a sudden, the floor turned into like a trampoline, and there was nothing but, you know, kind of a boarded up window and concrete slab out there. And Jill and I went flying out the rickety gangplank and in the basement and discovered there was no column underneath that corner of the house in the basement. We could imagine the legs dangling through the floor. But um, there have been many, many parties, many celebrations, New Year's Eve, birthdays, anniversaries, retirement, my retirement party this winter with a blizzard of, and, and a de desperate snowstorm still brought 70 people to this party. I think you better say a word about the hot tub jacuzzi. <laughs> Show where it is and a little bit about it. Oh, do I really have to yes, talk you have about it? To. <laughs> the Wiseman Good Spa? <laughs> well, I don't know. We, after, after my sister passed away, um, she left us a little bit of money and Sharon and I changed the garden around a little bit and put it in a hot tub and it's kind of become the you know, after a few bottles of wine. <laughs> in fact, what was it, three days ago, uh, there were several women who's, who shall remain nameless <laughs> at a party here for it's Memorial Day weekend. It's a large it's, it's, There are eight people can get into this thing. I think we had 12 <laughs> rather large women. We almost had a flood. <laughs> Water was displaced everywhere. But, you know, that and a little bit of music, and we can grow, you know, we figure we'll grow old gracefully. <laughs> we got to keep the arthritis from setting up. <laughs> you know. Tell us about your years of activism, both as a feminist and as a lesbian. Well, I think I need to take that question in two parts, um, because I can sort of divide my, my feminist activism in, into my professional work and then into my community work, my lesbian activism. Um, within my own field of architecture and planning, um, there are three areas that I think I've, I've made contributions in terms of feminism. The first is through founding organizations. Now, I already talked a, you know, quite a bit about the Women's School of Planning and Architecture, but there's another organization I'm quite proud of called Sheltering Ourselves, a Women's Learning Exchange. Um, in 19, oh, let me see, 19, I have, to, I have the date written down because there we go again. Okay, 87 it was. So in 85, I was invited to keynote the, a conference at University of Cincinnati um, in honor of the 10th anniversary of the founding of the Women's Studies program there. And the theme was Women in the City. So what I did was, um, you know, go in and actually talk about uh, gender and how cities affect women uh, differently than men and why, and, you know, having to do with child rearing and, and a number of other domestic violence, things like that. Out of that conference, I met a number of fascinating women, um, professionals, planners, builders, and so on. We decided to have a women's housing conference the following year in Cincinnati. And out of that conference, the school developed. Um, sheltering Ourselves is ongoing. It's been ongoing since 87. It's Cincinnati based, but it is involves a lot of women from Canada and some from Mexico. And a lot of residents of public housing projects. We try to cut across um, class and race and educational boundaries. And it's a forum to look at women's housing issues and community and economic development. So I'm very proud of that ongoing effort. Um, another area that I think I've, um, you know, made some contributions in is in publications and writing as an academic, as a scholar. Um, my first book, Discrimination by Design, A Feminist Critique of the Man-Made Environment, I spent 12 agonizing years, mostly in the summer in Orient, in the cottage, before we moved in here. It was published finally in 92. But it was ready to go in 85. That was a, a long story as to what happened in between. But the fact is that the book um, was my effort to really uh, create the field of feminist spatial theory. That's, that's a far-flung way of talking about trying to figure out how the built environment, not just architecture with a capital A, but all this built landscape, the stuff that corporations and developers and, you know, uh, banking institutions and so on fund and most of that's a good 90 percent of the built environment how those landscapes shape the experiences of our daily lives as well as the cultural assumptions about them so it looks at how gender race and class identities are reflected and reinforced in the things we build 
as a spatial language, you know, how, and how you can read the built environment like a text describing social relation. Um, and, you know, obviously I can go on and on, but I won't. But the fact is that, and I'll show you this, this book um, uh, was my, uh, again, uh, that this and the house will do it for me. The book has been translated into three languages, including Chinese, and it won several human rights awards, and it's still in print, and it's now become the kind of interdisciplinary um, textbook um, that brings, as you know, Lucy, I taught some of this at a course at your university, Brooklyn College, in the Women's Studies program. And, um, you know, it's still, much to my amazement, I'm still getting um, notes from students all over the world, you know, uh, thanking me for this book, so I'm very proud of that. Another one here is not a title I picked, called The Sex of Architecture, but it, they figured it would sell. This is an anthology of essays that I co-edited of 24 women, well, well known, internationally well known, women architects. And um, I have a chapter in it as well, but what I really like about it is that each essay has a dialogic relationship with another essay. They were paired, the authors were paired with each other. So one is an essay and the other's commentary on the essay. And uh, this one won an American Institute of Architects International um, a book publishing award for excellence in design theory. Uh, so, and then there's lots of book chapters and things in, in feminist texts, including Charlotte Bunch's very early anthology, Learning Our Ways, Essay in Feminist Education, you probably remember that one, and, and many others. And then the final arena in which I think my work has involved feminism has been my teaching. I've mentioned the course uh, in women's studies, but I've had joint appointments in architecture planning and women's studies at MIT and University of Illinois, where I was the George Miller Endowment Professor. And my work has not only involved looking at women in architecture and, again, feminist theory in architecture um, and ways of practicing architecture differently, but all of my architecture courses are community service projects. They all involve working with real clients on a pro bono basis, mostly in the Newark area, nonprofits that serve generally uh, groups that are disenfranchised or marginalized by gender, race, class, age, income, sexual orientation. So, and so we've been able to do really useful things like the first project in the country on housing for homeless women and children with HIV and AIDS, working with the head pediatrician at uh, Children's Hospital who was the doctor that discovered the HIV virus in infants. And, uh, Many, many worthwhile projects like that where I could drag my students unwittingly into social justice without their knowing about it, you know, and, and doing good. It's a win-win situation. It's been a, a great pleasure to be able to work that way. I have the safety of a regular paycheck, and I can do political work without the concern for a client having to pay for it. So it's been very good in that sense. I suppose in terms of lesbian feminism, um, I think it's important to mention um, the founding of, by Nancy Dean and myself and five other women of the Estrella Foundation, which is now, I guess, the Estrella National Lesbian International, International Lesbian Foundation, which you will remember, remember only too well because I believe you and Beva were instrumental in talking to Nancy about. Say a little something about we these. We licked really. a lot of envelopes and folded a lot of flyers, but it was it was really the original board of which you were a member and Nancy's Nancy's dream. Bev and I were groupies. Yes. Well, that organization um, is is so extraordinary today in scale and and longevity. And when Nancy approached me, actually, they were, you know, it was a weekend in Orient. I was in the cottages. It was 77, 1977. And, um, you know, of course, as a feminist, I understood all too well that there was no money available for women's projects, uh, especially poor women and, you know, women in prison and women who were abused and so on. And uh, Nancy's proposal to me one Sunday afternoon, um, sitting over coffee, was to do something about it, to create our own philanthropic foundation. And I thought, what a brilliant idea. So we spent the next three years of our lives 
in each other's, you know, apartments in New York, um, a very diverse board, which by, was on, planned on purpose, racially diverse, economically diverse, very different backgrounds, carving out quite visionary bylaws, very creative bylaws, that sustain the organization, um, created great political disruption in the process uh, as new women came in and attempted to carry on. That's a whole other conversation. But I was privileged to be the co-chair with Betty Powell, the honorary co-chair, uh, in 1998 at the 20th anniversary of Australia at the Sheraton Hotel in New York where uh, we received awards, the founding mothers received awards. And, uh, so th that organization was very important, um, I think. And uh, of course, there's Nuffwuf, good old North Fork Women for Women Fund, and uh, those very, very early days when I remember us meeting in Mary Ann's backyard, and I had a bunch of paper pinned up to the side of her barn trying to talk about the old Dykes home and what should we do, and Beva wanting to do a swimming pool, and you know, my wanting to do a survey, which we did actually do, mm -hmm. that very first survey of the lesbian community. What would you think? There were maybe 150 of us around? 100? I think so, yes. Something like the that by then. list was extensive. We now have 380 on our mailing list, 600 on our mailing list. That's right. But 380 who are part-time or full-time residents of the North Fork, which is... <laughs> and you know that's not all the lesbians on the North Fork. Those are the ones who are able to be on the mailing list comfortably. There are many who unfortunately still feel uncomfortable about, about that. And, um, you know, Nufwolf has been the glue in our community for many years. We got too large to have big public events, you know, in people's well, homes. Well, we have the auction benefit. Well, no, I mean, that's the point. Nufwolf took the place of the private parties. Right because there were too many, uh, too many people, and no one had a big enough house, and no one wanted that. And the good news is you can now be friends with whomever you choose to be friends with, because <laughs> they, being a lesbian is not the only requirement anymore, you know. You might have to have something else in common with them, you oh. know. <laughs> shocking, shocking, isn't it? It's called normal, I think. So, let me see. What, well, now, tell, tell a little bit. You were president of the North Fork Women for Women Fund. Yeah. What do they, what does it do? What's it As if you didn't hurt know, right? It's gold, she <laughs> yeah. said innocently. Yes, right. Innocent in my eye. Uh, this is the real, you know, sort of president for many years. But yeah, I was on the board and, of course, a very active member and on the committee that Lucy founded, you founded, the Cultural Arts and Events Committee. Um, um, and uh, look, Nufwuf, of course, is dedicated to reaching out to women in the lesbian community to ensure that no woman winds up uh, dying of cancer or having a disease simply because they couldn't afford a pap test or medication or uh, a medical uh, procedure, and also to provide emotional and, uh, you know, uh, any other kind of support we possibly can to women who who need us, and uh, it is healthcare related, but um, it's done remarkably wonderful things. And as president, I was uh, very interested in doing a um, another survey, which I conducted uh, with the survey committee, of course, um, in 2002, and that was like a 10-year review. And it was extremely revealing about the diversity uh, in our community. Now we still don't have racial diversity. We do have many Spanish-speaking, you know, different Spanish-speaking cultures, and we have some Asian women, and I think we have three African-American women. But that's a factor of the North Fork. I mean, we reflect, uh, you know, basically the general population of the North Fork as well. Um, it's a remarkable organization, and, uh, you know, I'm very happy that the Smith Archives understands how important it is to document underrepresented communities, and our community is remarkable. Well, so what is life like for a young retiree in the North Fork lesbian community? Um, how did you find the chutzpah to retire? <laughs> well, it took a lot of chutzpah, I'll tell you. I, you know, I, here's how I did it. First of all, I have to tell you, I don't know what it feels like. I feel like I'm on a sabbatical. I'm still working full time. I have two research grants I'm finishing, and, and I'm, uh, you know, I just finished up my teaching. And, so I, it hasn't really hit me yet. 
in terms of a, a transformation of work. But I've decided to retire from teaching, and I'll tell you the reasons why, but certainly from teaching at NJIT, but not to retire from working. Um, you know, we've talked about these various losses, um, unexpected illnesses. Uh, Sharon and I have been together a long time, and she has been enormously supportive of my workaholism, my commitments to political activism. And um, it's our turn. It's our turn. When we had our 25th anniversary, I looked at her and I said, there's only one thing I can give you that we don't already have, and that's more time together. And um, so that's why I did it, really. I'm 58. I'll be 59 in November. I certainly have intentions of continuing professionally. In fact, I'm doing a lot of conferences and continuing to lecture at universities. And I will teach again, I'm sure. I just love teaching. I'd like to actually teach in um, medical school. I taught at the University of Medicine and Dentistry. My specialty is healthcare, ironically, architecture. And I'd like to teach medical professionals about the impact that their surroundings, their workplaces, their hospitals, their um, offices, and so on, their clinics have on wellness or illness, how it can promote um, wellness and reduce stress or contribute to illness. And I think that would be very interesting to do. Uh, so, but I'll tell you, one of the reasons that it's easy for me to think about being here is our community. And that's because there is a fullness here, and I mean both communities, the lesbian community as well as the local North Fork community, which is increasingly accepting of our lesbian community. Um, let me talk a little bit about our own community. When you think about the Narrow River Singers, and, you know, I'm not a singer, but I love to sing. My mother was a singer. You're a singer, you know. And you understand better than anyone the joy that singing brings to people's lives. And we have this wonderful chorus that we work like animals to do a good job, you know. And Sharon's been the videographer forever on, on, on those great concerts that we do free for our community. And... Um, you know, of course, all the Norfolk events are, are wonderful <laughs> events and fun to go to. Um, there are poetry readings. There are uh, you, the salon that you and Patsy do where, where we all tell about the interesting work we're doing and show slides of various things, we've, places we've traveled. Um, there are endless political causes out here uh, on the North Fork, uh, aside from Norfolk. And um, I hope, you know, to be involved with them more and more. Uh, I, one of the most wonderful things that happened recently is the Domestic Partnership Registry. When I was president, I came out to the North Fork because I thought Norfolk should also be out. Now, it was under Elaine Romagnoli's presidency two years before that our bylaws were changed to reflect the fact that we're a lesbian organization. As you'll recall, it, the bylaws originally said women for women fund. We clarified that. And uh, it was Labor Day weekend, a newspaper, the Suffolk Times, a huge article um, on Nuffwolf with my face along with a couple of other board members who could be out. So we were out to the public, but then uh, you and I and Sharon and Patsy went last year to register in East Hampton as domestic partners after all these years. Mm -hmm. You know, the four of us had a great time. Mm -hmm. And then just this past March here on, in South Hole, um, we were at the town hall meeting which was a public hearing on the Domestic Partnership Registry. And I got up and spoke at, with the ability to say, I'm here with my partner of 26 years to speak in favor of this registry and representing as past president a large lesbian community who also support this. And of course, it passed unanimously. Um, many people from the local community spoke in favor of it. and. Uh, so it's, it's a really very marvelous place to live, and I look forward to being here. I still have the apartment in the city. I'm not ready to give that up, and uh, I can maybe play tourist in New York now and, yeah. and uh, enjoy it. So, Well, what's in your future plans uh, for our community and in your own career? Well, let's see. Um, I mentioned a couple of teaching things that I'm interested in doing. There are more books up my sleeve. I'm actually personally interested in po the possibility, and I can't commit to this yet, but um, 
many of the things that I learned in doing this house have to do with the fact that, you know, we do have an aging population. That's true all over the world, but certainly on the North Fork we have an aging population, as is typical of most exurban or suburban communities. And I'm interested in helping people age in place by changing their existing home around to make it more accessible, more comfortable. I know how to make a house safe for someone who has dementia so that they won't burn themselves or get lost. Um, I'd like to, to see if I might not involve myself in part-time design practice in, in that particular way. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, in terms of the community, I hope to see myself at some point in either elected or appointed or voluntary political office on some sort of planning or zoning board or open land preservation committee or hamlet stewardship. Um, I'd like to contribute my expertise as a volunteer, not just my time. And that's something I can see myself doing. As far as my vision for our lesbian community, I hope and plan on Mufluf evolving and sus being sustained over many years. But to do so, it has to remain in touch with what is necessary and needed on the North Fork. I would like the organization to become even more political. And I think I would really like to do something radical, which is to entertain um, not only ongoing primary outreach to the lesbian community, but either expanding the geographic boundaries of that lesbian community to extend beyond Riverhead, and or looking at ways of participating with other organizations, or even perhaps expanding our mission somewhat to look at other women in need. There is a huge immigrant population, mostly of Guatemalan women, who are frequently victims of domestic violence. And they are our invisible community, as are a number of African American women who live in poverty. And I, there are health issues involved here. And I would like to consider the possibility, and this is me only, and this is not representing the board or anything else, um, because I'm politically active, and my lesbian feminism has always embraced race, class, ethnicity, you know, sexuality, age, all those isms, that I would like to see the feminism within Nufluf, um consider ways of aligning our lesbian organization with other organizations that do good things for women in need. Thank you, Leslie. It's it's always instructive talking with you, but mainly it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. You're welcome. Thank you, Sandra, for being such a great camera woman. She's my friend, too. She